This morning's lectionary text is the final two verses of Matthew chapter 10. I think you'll find them much easier to swallow than the ones we heard last week, which were <laughs> the first few verses of that chapter. You are invited to follow along on the screen or from the Pew Bible as I read it aloud. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Thank you, Diane. How many of you invited uh, a friend to worship today? Oh, wonderful! We actually had some hands go up. Good on you. Fantastic. Inviting people to church can be awkward because we're not completely sure, are we, of what sort of experiment or experience they'll have, right? I mean, church is weird to people who haven't been raised in it. We speak a different language here. We have uh, preludes and postludes, acolytes and liturgists, introits and offertories, stoles. Whoops, I forgot my stole today. <laughs> And paraments, these things, words of institution, and today communion by intinction. Many unchurched or dechurched people want to connect with God. I really believe that. It's just that the church thing kind of scares them. Now, some have tried it, some grew up in church and then chose to leave. Their problem isn't so much with God as it is with the local church not reflecting God very much. And many people have a story about church that doesn't end well. It's tragic. It's tragic that the local church can actually be an obstacle to people who want to grow spiritually. And the interesting thing is that when Jesus was on the earth, non-religious people loved him. They wanted to be with him. Everywhere he went, everywhere he taught, the unchurched, unbelieving, spiritually seeking people flocked to be near Jesus. Now, even though Jesus was a religious leader, he didn't spend most of his time with the religious people. Non-religious people flocked to him, and ironically, the religious people oftentimes were offended by him. Isn't that ironic? Jesus didn't really fit with religious people, and religious people didn't really fit with him. It was the sinners, the people like you and, and me, who flocked to hear Jesus' teaching. And here's the amazing thing. As holy and righteous and loving as Jesus was, unchurched people were drawn to him. They wanted to be in his presence, and I find that fascinating. That unholy people or people who are doing unholy things are drawn to someone who is actually holy. Now, sadly, the average local church today has the opposite effect on unreligious or irreligious or unbelieving or not so sure what they believe people. These people are not flocking to the church in America. And when they do happen to come, either coercion or maybe a friend invites them or something, you know, sometimes, sadly, they experience judgment. They won't experience that here, I hope. And the tragedy is that the church is supposed to be the body of Christ, which means that the closest that we'll ever be, the closest that we ever get to be, this side of heaven, to a sense of Jesus in the flesh, is right here. We're sort of Jesus with a face on, or with hands, or with feet. 
The church is designed to function as Jesus himself, and that's why we are called the body of Christ. But why is it that outsiders seem uninterested in mainline Protestant churches today? Why has average worship attendance in this great country of ours uh, been on a decline for well over a decade? And is it the case that the local church is failing to help people connect with God? Has the local church devolved into something that no longer reflects the person of Jesus. I have only one big concern for Manhattan Beach Community Church, and that's that we don't go the way of so many other churches in our great nation. And that is we must never be content with being irrelevant or unwelcoming to unchurched people. And if unchurched people ever feel like Uh, we're not worthy of a visit, and they stop participating at MBCC, it, it might also feel that maybe God has stopped showing up at MBCC. And I say that because the Bible proclaims that God is more concerned about the outsider than the insider. God is more concerned about the unbeliever than the believer. I mean, Jesus is all about Leaving the 99, you know, those already convinced ones, those in the fold, leaving them behind and going out in search of the lost one. The thing that makes MBCC unique as a church isn't our music, as wonderful as that music is. And it's not the preaching, whatever you might think of that. What makes MBCC unique is in, in this community is our commitment to creating safe space where all feel welcome. And that includes those who aren't sure, those who don't believe, those who must overcome huge fear just to walk into this beautiful sanctuary, those who've had a bad church experience in the past. Now, I hope that unchurched people feel welcome here. I'd love to hear them, you know, overhear them at the door when they don't know I'm listening. Say something like this. Well, I don't know if I bind all this churchy stuff, but I feel authentic love in this community. Yes, I feel compassion here in this place. Or, or something like this. Well, I don't know if I believe everything in that Bible or align with everything that preacher says, but... The people at MBCC seem so nice, and they're so accepting and caring. And did you see those rainbow doors out on Peck Avenue? There's something about MBCC that makes me want to come back. I love overhearing stuff like this, uh, or, or, or something like this. Well, I'm not sure what I believe, but I think I can grow spiritually here in this loving community where it's okay to question and be real, and be honest. I'd love to hear, overhear, comments like that. You know, genuine love is what attracted the unbelievers, the unchurched, the irreligious people, way back some 2,000 years ago, when they encountered Jesus. They weren't sure. They understood everything Jesus was saying. Certainly the disciples were oftentimes clueless. But they sense something in him, something so unique, something so authentic, so real, that even though they were living unholy lives, they were drawn to this one who seemed to be so holy other. And they weren't put off by the holiness. And that's my main concern at MBCC. No matter what the future holds, no matter what changes might happen with our beloved traditions and our staff and our worship styles, my main concern is that we will always seek to be relevant in today's culture and never, ever lose the welcoming love that has shaped this community church from the very beginning, when the cross was first put in the sand, so to speak. The love of which Jesus speaks in today's text is not mere sentimentality. 
It's love in action. He mentions giving a cup of water to one of the little ones, and it, it, it's such a small, seemingly insignificant thing, really. But it's a profound act because it brings face to face those who have resources with those who are in need, those who are thirsty. It gets you up close and personal, one on one, equal, really, in our need for water that sustains life. And there's no substitute for such an act of kindness because <laughs> it's the essence of love, not sentimentality. Acts of kindness, essence of love. Many of you have already contributed backpacks, and the contents of that will be lovingly placed. Uh, you, you are contributing contents and backpacks, and those contents will be put in the backpacks, and they will be lovingly given to children connected with the family, uh, family promise, uh, unhoused families in need. And at MBCC, we welcome not just the comfortable and the well-situated, but we welcome also those on the margins, right? The poor, the outcast, the unlovely, the unloved, those who thirst and those who are spiritually hungry. I can't tell you how many people I have met who say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. We have a wide open opportunity to connect with those people. And when we love others in this way, we not only give life to them, but we give life to ourselves as well. You know, the Holy One in us touches the Holy One in them. And we're both changed. I'll never forget the days when I was a young father and I heard the baby cry, which I did the last several nights. And um, I offered to get up to be with Huddy, but he's not into the body bottle feeding yet. And so it, it relies heavily on mama and daddy to, uh, to tend to him, whether it's diapers or, or breastfeeding. But I'll never forget those days when I was a young parent and I heard those cries. The kids would call for help in the middle of the night. And we learn something, do we not, about ourselves when we get to that stage in our life where our lives are not just our own. Likewise, when we reach out to a stranger in need who's thirsty or hungry or unhoused or unchurched, we learn something about ourselves as neighbor. Getting up close and personal with others helps us. As our Buddhist friends will say, it helps us to see rightly. It helps us to see the invisible threads that bind us, the thirsts that we share, the injustices that we abhor, the hopes that we harbor, the dreams that we dream. When we're in face-to-face -face encounters with those who are hurting, those who are struggling, we can see behind our own relatively comfortable lives to a bigger picture of those who don't even have the basic necessities of life. And we're moved to love, not just sentimental love, but we're moved to acts of kindness on a larger scale. And we might even find ourselves involved in political action in the form of writing a dramatic script or screenplay to help bring about a world where we have access to clean water, to food, to health care, to education without fear of gun violence to human rights and dignity. Little cups of water are things we do in the name of Jesus to show others that we care and we're thinking of them and we love them. Here are just a few examples. There's Becky Tan with her granddaughter bringing in backpacks during a staff meeting. It's the best way to get interrupted during a staff meeting. People coming in to give part of the uh, 50 backpacks that we're wanting to give. And then this rascal. Uh, he's the most active 80-year-old I've ever met. Uh, Craig, you're not 80. I'm, I'm sorry there. That, that, you, you skipped forward. That's Craig, and he's more, mostly happy. David, thank you. That's a, that, and there's Becky. We care enough to share. 
I have to tell you, let's stop right here for a second. I got a call from the pastor, John, over at St. Paul's, and he gushed, and he gushed, and he gushed over our volunteers, not the least of which is right here, Diane Carter, who's over there all the time cooking meals uh, for about 60 people once a week, and then we got about, what, 460 to get uh, access to the pantry that we support, all of you that, that give, uh, and Becky's just so faithful at all of her work with the with the food pantry. Okay, let's go on. Just a few more here, I think. Oh, and this lovely lady who I love to tease. I caught her in the act this morning, dropping off a backpack. Yeah, I think that's it. Nope, there's more. There's Larry, carrying his cross. <laughs> and then our Pastor Jody, I'm telling you, you are so, we are so blessed. She has a pastor's heart, and this is her holding Bev's hand with Bob. We had just finished praying together, and um, if you know somebody that's homebound, shut in, recently hospitalized, that wants to get love, feel like that warm little baby wrapped in a, a, a nice little terry cloth, you know, after a bath, you know, anyway, I go, I, I, I've got baby on my mind, grandbaby on my mind, but if you want somebody to get some love and nurture, talk to, talk to Jody. You know, we all want to be seen. We all want to be wrapped in a little warm blanket of love. We all want to be cared for. And too often we're so preoccupied with ourselves and our immediate families that we fail to hear the cries of the thirsty around us. Just a little cup of water is all they need. Just a little caring act to show that someone thinks they're important and of value. The thirsty are all around us. They're in our church right now. We have people battling cancer right now. We have people battling uh, dementia right now. We have spouses right now. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, Dan Jensen's going to celebrate the life of his beloved Cheryl. And she died way too soon in her 60s of cancer. We have a world of hurt. And these people who are in need live beside us and work beside us, and they even live under our roof. And just a little cup of water would go so far and help them so much to realize that they are loved. The manse is almost finished, and it's been a long time in coming, and I have many people to thank, and I will. So many of you have given cups of water to me over the past 11 months, and I want to thank you. Thanks for caring. Church staff and families do not always feel like they're cared for in a church. So just a little cup of cool water, just a small act that says you care, means far more than you know. When John Huguenin found out that our youth director, Ricardo, needed a place to live, he opened up his home to him. And this past week, Pastor Jody found a place to live in Hermosa Beach, and I trust that our church members will step up to help her with her move, invite her into your homes, and help her in thoughtful ways as she makes her transition from Utah, and all her belongings are still in a box. Trust me, I understand that feeling. And she has limited resources right now because a lot of her things, pots and pans and stoles and robes and such, and outfits are still in storage. Reach out to her. How can I help? Surely this has happened to you. Someone's reached out to you with a cup of cool water, so to speak. And remember when that happened, especially when it was unexpected, and it was just what you needed, how it made you feel? It may have just been a little thing, but it said, hey, we're thinking of you. Hey, we're imagining what it's like to be in your shoes right now. A little cup of water can mean a lot when you're thirsty. Now, we can all do this. We don't have to be rich to show that we care. Everyone, even our children and youth, have cups of water that they can give. It's, it, it's within all of our a power to do little acts of kindness every day. So I want to challenge you this week to look for the thirsty. Seek opportunities to give cups of water. Pray and the Spirit will make you aware of opportunities. And you might be prompted by the Spirit 
to call a friend that you haven't seen in a while and simply say, I've been thinking about you. Don't, don't, don't do any of that drive-by shaming or, or blaming or whatever. Yeah, you haven't been in church in a month. No, no, no. just let them know. I've been thinking about you. And some of you might be prompted to, to volunteer to, to watch children so the young parents in our church can go out and, and have some quality one-on-one -on -one time. And others of you might want to support the meal train for uh, Heather's family as she battles her physical challenges right now. We have guests in worship almost every Sunday. And today is no exception. How about giving a guest today a cup of, of cold water? Don't douse it on their head. Just, you know, metaphorically speaking, invite them down to uh, donuts and coffee. That's a start. And teens, you're not off the hook. You can help at home without being told to do the dishes or the laundry or lawn care. Just surprise your parents one day and do it out of love. Look for ways to bless back the parents who do so much for you. You'll find the ways. You can also do something nice for your siblings, your brother and sister. I know it might blow them away that you made their bed just for the heck of it. Pray and the Spirit might prompt you to spend some time with your homebound friends at MBCC who have been home since all through COVID and are still not feeling safe enough to come out or can't. I imagine some of our homebound members are very, very thirsty. And some of you also might be burning with thirst, wondering if anyone really cares about you. Some of you might be tired of being thirsty and tired of that empty hunger and that thirst in your soul. And if that describes your journey, I invite you to drink from the well that we're drinking from, the living water that Christ offers us, that sustains us as a church and as individual followers. If you're here today and you don't know where you stand with God, let me speak on God's behalf. It's a, da it's a dangerous thing to do, but I'm, I'm going to dare to do it. Speak on God's behalf. God would love for you to feel more connected to your creator. You are the focus of God's attention and God's affection. And God is searching for you and won't stop. And the good news is when you connect with God, you won't find an angry God who keeps a list of all the things you've done that are unholy. Instead, you'll find a very forgiving heavenly parent who rushes out to you and embraces you and says, I'm so glad you're back. Let's party. I have scripture to back that up. You can talk to me later. You might already know of the prodigal son. Friends, we get to do this. We get to be a welcoming church. We get to offer cups of cold water daily. And when we do, beautiful things happen within us and around us. And the holy in us touches the holy in others. And there's nothing quite like it. There's nothing quite like being a sinner that gets to touch holiness again and again. Every time you get out of your own personal preferences and think about others. Over time, the living water that we give away has a way of soaking into us even more, and we become even more welcoming. And lo and behold, we even become transformed. Amen. Amen.